There. Good. Hey, there. there it goes. There it is. Greetings, Internet. Welcome to the Comic Watcher Show, episode 101. Not to be confused with the rather Orwellian Room 101. Uh, I am your host, Matt, coming at you once again. And with me this week is, is Mike, a.k.a. Scoop. And uh, Nick is taking a well-deserved week off. So, Nick, buddy, get some sleep. Read some of those Valiant comics you, you claim to like so much. Um, but with <laughs> us this week... Is, that that's a that's a subtle jab at our sister show Valiant Watch. We've got a friendly competition going with them. The Nick uh, he's show, a lot of Valiant. We frequently well, pit him against his other show. I hope they're paying uh, you well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with us this week as the man, the myth, the legend, Richard Starkings, founder of uh, Hey. Founder of Comic Craft, letterer extraordinaire, writer of Elephant Men, and currently on Comicsology, Ask for Mercy. So uh, he's going to talk with us about anything and everything. So Richard, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for uh, having me. Absolutely, man. Uh, we're we're really thrilled that that you could take some time to hang out with us, and um, hopefully we don't bore you too much. But um, Anyway, uh, well, not, not off. I'll blame that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, as I, you know, I just turned forty, and 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 I understand the power of the nap is real. <laughs> so I get it. Um, but so you've got uh, a wonderful project on Comicsology called uh, "Ask for Mercy." The third season is about halfway through. Um, for folks that are not familiar with ask for mercy would you like to talk about what it is yeah it's a it's a action adventure fantasy series uh it's a little bit science fiction but i wanted to try my hand at uh fantasy because i have a my other comicsology title elephant men which of course was 10 years at image um is science fiction and it sort of locks you down and i was wanting to have monsters and things that could fly and, and swords that appear out of nowhere. So um, it's the story of Mercy, who thinks she is just a real estate agent in England, in Banbury. And then she finds out she's actually something else. And she's whisked away to, uh, in season one, Nazi Germany. Actually, Nazi-occupied France, Paris, to begin with. Um, where she has to fight alongside a band of monsters against Himmler and his SS. So, oh, wow. yeah, there's no sort of kidding around in season one. And um, season two continues with the same characters, but takes us to um, the 1870s North America and the plight of the indigenous people and the Battle of Little Bighorn. So um, it's a time-traveling magic-slash-fantasy series with monsters. That is awesome. And uh, season three, going on right now, issue uh, three just hit, Comixology. Yep. And each season is six issues, so we're yep. halfway through. So uh, I, I guess my, my first question is, uh, how do you have an endpoint in mind? Uh, how many seasons? Oh, are you yeah. Shame on you! Shame oh. on you! That is a one hundred and one question. You know, it's like <laughs> oh, when they, when the they cast the like Doctor Who, the first thing they ask is when you're leaving. You know, um, I don't think anyone really, truly sets out on a series that you know, especially when you put a lot of work in, into it. You don't think this is going to end. And in fact, um, I didn't think I would get past six issues of Elephant Men. And of course, I've done 110 now. Um, and when we wrapped up the image imprint of Elephant Men at, at issue 80, I thought, that's it. I'm done with that. And then um, Comixology sort of came knocking. And I always wanted to publish digitally because... That is the future. It's not the future. It's the present of comics. So many people read comics on tablets. I remember I was at New York Comic Con 
eight or nine years ago, and the iPad had not been out very long, and I saw somebody reading a comic on the subway um, eight, nine years ago. And I was like, well, that's it. It's done. The moment you can carry a computer onto the subway that has the size, the dimensions of a comic, you know, game over. So I had talked to David Steinberger and Chip Mosier at Comixology at Chicago like a year later. And I said, when are you going to start doing originals? And um, so As for Mercy and Elephant Men were two of the first four books out of the gate at Comixology. And I also already knew, as did Chip, you know, when, when I pitched Elephant Men, he was a little hesitant at first. And then he looked at my digital sales on Elephant Men. So that was a no brainer. So, you know, a hundred issues of Elephant Men under my belt thinking I could do six. Um, and you're asking me when I'm going to wrap up As for Mercy, you know. Okay. Fair, fair point. First Tuesday. I have, I have been properly <laughs> chastised. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, go ahead. Man. That's what happens when you don't do the homework. <laughs> Busted. Busted. <laughs> so. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and you know, the, the, uh, looking back, when you originally um, started Ask for Mercy, um, was it always going to be um, like when you saw the success of the first season? And then you went into the second season. Like, how, like, was it like just a first season, or when you thought that you saw the success of the first season with you and Abigail, that you wanted to do a second season? And what was the the influence, especially with the second season being so drastically different with a different time, a different setting um, for the uh, second season of Astro Mercy? Yeah, I wouldn't, you know, yes, it's a different setting and obviously there's time travel involved. Mm -hmm. uh, but without the sort of clumsy, you know, mechanics of getting into a time ship and traveling, you know, this, this is about get to where the story's at and tell the story. So, um, I did very consciously ever since I worked at Marvel UK mm -hmm. and I, I, I was uh, Alan Grant who used to write detective comics and judge dread mm -hmm. um, wanted to do a monthly original series with Marvel UK. And he pitched a lot of ideas and I, I realized just how difficult it is to come up with characters that are self-motivated, that they, they carry their, mission inside of them so batman you know he wants to avenge the death of his parents by beating up every criminal out there right, right, right. spider-man wants to save innocence like uncle ben mm -hmm. you know? and, and so that's an internalized motivation whereas lord of the rings you know the moment uh, frodo gets to mordor uh end of story so alan was pitching a lot of lord of the rings type quest stories and, and I, I feel like you know you, you tend to fall into one of those two camps you know like terminator is actually a quest story once you know sarah connor is dead or, or once you know the mission is ended or changed or whatever it's it's done everybody goes home and then you have to restart the mission again um but the beauty of most superheroes is their motivation is internal so we were struggling with Alan, we were struggling to find a motivation, you know, an internally motivated character so that it could run and run. And it was that sort of moment as an editor where I realized just how brilliant, you know, the best characters and story stories are. Because when you can constantly tell stories about a character, um, you know, the, the X-Files is a great example. They're always investigating. You know, so that, that's why we have so many CSI shows, so many um, uh, criminal investigation shows, because there's always a new crime, right? So, um, so on Elephant Men, I feel like that was the first time I created characters that were internally motivated because they're human animal hybrids trapped in a world they never made, right? So, they're always going to be discriminated against. They're always frightening. And, um, you know, Hip Flask, the lead character in Elephant Man, basically investigates crimes against or involving elephant men, you know. Right. And, 
and you have the protagonist, the antagonist, and they are where they are, and the stories develop from their situation. Um, there's no quest, there's no end in sight. So it was a lot easier to write stories about them than I thought it was going to be because I think I had inter I had internalized that distinction. You know, how do you make a character sort of self-motivated? Now, Mercy's very different in that she's kind of one of those characters that wants to go home. Right, she, right. Um, and she goes home. But, you know, in the bigger story arc, which is unraveling in season three, mm -hmm. we find out why she's in the situation in season three that she's in. And, and it has a lot to do with season two and it has a lot to do with season one. And there are a lot of um, uh, returns to, to situations um, in earlier stories. And the, the closest I just watched on Netflix, this German series called Dark, mm -hmm. and, and, and it, which is a time travel story with multiple versions of different characters. Um, and, and that's this, I, I realize that thematically I am touching upon a lot of similar issues, but there's no magic in dark. There's no monsters in dark. It's human monsters. But, um, you know, so, you know, the, the story is a band of monsters hunting monsters. And again, you know, the, the closest I, I realize, oh, is this BPRD? You know, um, have I, you know, subconsciously tried to create DPRD? But, right. but Abigail and I started with, we both love Doctor Strange. You know, I wanted to do a female uh, protagonist because there's a character in Elephant Men called um, Yvette. And mm -hmm. telling her story was so satisfying because she was a, a resistance fighter in the war uh, with the Elephant Men. And when her story came along, people just loved that character. And she was one of those characters that kept coming back from the dead. So I knew that I loved that character. And I knew that people were, oh, it's Yvette, you know, when she came back. And in fact, she was in issue one of the first comicsology Elephant Men in flashback. But she, 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 she performed a very important role in Elephant Men season one. So Mercy is a lot like Yvette, except... Um, she sort of sucked into this story of monsters fighting monsters. Um, but I don't think the stories are different. They're definitely about, you know, man's inhumanity to man. And, you know, I do a lot of research before getting into each story. In fact, it was nice on this one. The new season is set now, which at first seemed like a good idea. And then COVID came along. Um, so we incorporated it into the story. Um, so uh, it's it's both current and three years in the future. So it's been it's, it's been very interesting to sort of play with uh, modern times and sort of continue that theme of, of uh, man's inhumanity to man, I think. Very prescient. Yeah. Um, awesome. <laughs> Lucky roll. Well, it was bizarre because in January, uh, Abigail had drawn the first issue. And we had the streets of uh, Leeds, which is my hometown in England, empty. And then a month later, the streets of Leeds were empty, which meant Abigail had some incredible photo reference. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. There you go. Wow. <laughs> and season three is basically our version of War of the Worlds. Okay. You know? Okay. Right on. We're big fans of the musical version of War of the Worlds by um, Jeff Wayne. If you haven't listened to that, you are missing a treat. Huh. It oh, is easily yeah. the best adaptation of War of the Worlds in any medium. That's awesome. Definitely something to write down for sure on my end. Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm sure. I know the concert's on YouTube, but I'm sh you need to go to Spotify and listen to the original with um, Phil Linnett is on it. He's from Thin Lizzy. Um, oh, uh richard burton the actor it was one of the last things he did wow um david essex who's a british pop star um liam neeson was on the newer version of it yeah. it, it is cool. it, it is very uh highly thought of in uh britain and australia of all places really yeah it's awesome <laughs> so when, when you create a character and you find that you love them like Abigail or Yvette or um, uh, Mercy, 
Uh, do you find it hard- too. She's a great character. Yeah. <laughs> do you find it harder as a writer to put them through the paces? Like, no, you have easier. a harder time killing your darlings, I guess. No, easier. It's it, you, You've got to put your characters where they're the most uncomfortable. Otherwise, you don't really get a story. Um, and sometimes you have to separate them, you know, especially teams. You need to separate them to find out what they feel or think about each other, how they act together. You have to see them separate in order to right. appreciate them as a team. So it's a lot of fun. And we have a character called Budgie, who's a sort of uh, idiot savant monster, shape changer. Um, and he's so powerful, I keep having to push him slightly to the side because he, he's he's a simpleton and he's kind of like a pet. <laughs> but he's, he's a really destructive pet. <laughs> you know, so like, I got to ask now, was Budgie named for the band Budgie? No, Budgies are songbirds Whoa. in England. That's what we call songbirds in England. Ah, Budgie okay. with us. Um, okay. And we wanted this character who was sort of extra dimensional. That that originally we were inspired by this artist called Bixinski, who who's this Eastern Bloc artist who does these nightmarish figures and scenarios it's very sort of communist russia yeah. uh with uh just a dark giga-esque element to them so we were looking at at some of his drawings and um i i wanted a monster that was n- not like a typical like a vampire or a, a werewolf we, you know and even our werewolf is not exactly a werewolf because he doesn't need the full moon but um so we wanted a monster and the, the moment Abigail drew this creature, I, the name Budgie popped in my head and, and stuck. And in fact, we had a one shot in between seasons one or two called Ask for Budgie because he was just so much fun to play with. He was He's, he's a sort of, um, yeah, he's like a pet. He's like a, a sort of three-year-old. Yeah. So, <laughs> and he plays, and he plays <laughs> things, so it's really a joy uh, to work with Abigail because it's definitely a collaboration. You know, we came up with the characters together. Um, she insisted that uh, this character Casa would be uh, the White Buffalo Woman, and in fact, I had never heard of the White Buffalo Woman until um, Abigail referred me to her legend. And oh. season two is about her character and about her people and about the mythology that surrounds um little bighorn and um sitting bull you know and uh, w- you know we, we found out a lot there's a lot of history in both season one and two um but hopefully it's presented in an entertaining way but you know i i'd known for a long time that himmler was interested in uh, the supernatural um, and believed himself to be the reincarnation of a king, mm. um, but you know the, you know, and he he had uh, supernatural ceremonies at this castle in Wevelsberg, Germany, and that's where our story sort of the finale takes place. So, um, yeah, he, you know, Hitler too was interested in in the supernatural, but Himmler was a real fanatic. Huh. That's awesome. I mean, it's just such a like su- such a notion that that's right for use and exploration because you have the supernatural and Nazis. <laughs> there's, well, there's a lot you, know, you can and, do with that. You know, it's a it's a you know if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. You know, mm. we're, we're living in very um, uncomfortable times, indeed, right now where there's a lot of division, and that's Nazi Germany. Yeah. Right there, you know, the the moment moment you start to regard people as other, you're, you're in trouble. You know, we've been on a slippery slope in the Western world for the last 10 years, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe just four years. Um, but, you know, <laughs> we, we, we have to. We, 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 we can't go backwards. We have to be more civilized. And, you know, it's ironic that you use monsters to tell stories that, show that humans are the real monsters but oh yeah it's yeah. inevitable 
I think some of my favorite stories do that. So <laughs> right on. Yeah, well, the X Men, they're really monsters, you know. There you go. There you uh, go. It's about the people who are, who are different coming together. You know, Elephant Man is about that. Yeah. It's about getting to know the strangers in your midst. You know, um, I'm a Buddhist. You know, I, I meet with fellow Buddhists every month, and, you know, they're from all different cultures Indian, Japanese. Um, you know, American, English, you know, so um, I'm, I'm a big believer in crossing cultural divides and getting to know people from cultures that were, quote unquote, alien to me originally. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it makes you and, and your life more well-rounded and, and enriched and, it, you know, adds to your experience. Exactly. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I. And we live, in, we live in just too big of a world, you know. I yeah. mean, we're, we're what in three different states right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And absolutely. There was just a, an interesting thread on on my Facebook today about whether you know we need movie theaters to stay open. Yeah. Um, and in fact, you know, I already feel that I talk with my friends about shows on Netflix, HBO, and. Amazon or even um, YouTube and Hulu, you know, um, and I think the water cooler is streaming services now, you know, yeah. Cobra Kai is one that I never yes. knew existed until everybody was talking about it on, on, on Facebook. And I was like, Wait, karate kid, really? <laughs> <laughs> really? And, <laughs> and what, what a joy that was. And, and that's another, that's a show about, you know, understanding the other and, you know, overcoming differences most definitely <clears throat> absolutely. Uh, mike go go ahead yeah absolutely um you know richard um you know we we've mentioned abigail harding a few times and just talking I, i'd like to know how you guys um hooked up and doing ask for mercy because uh i know season one season two were such an extraordinary uh story and her art is that perfect i think is that perfect fit um for that extraordinary story yeah you know, just something about how you were writing you know especially like here we talked about budgie especially budgie um and just her art just really took your words and turned them into some uh, some great visuals i mean how did you guys hook up and how were you guys just kind of going back and forth with your creativeness through seasons one and seasons two? Well, um, we met at uh, mm -hmm. Traveling Man, which is a, one of four comic book stores in the north of England. Mm -hmm. uh, some of my favorite comic book stores. They're also game stores. They do games and comics. Um, because I'm very good friends with uh, Nabil Homsey, who is the owner of the stores. And I've done a lot of signings there over the last 11 years. Um, and Lisa Wood, who uh, used to be uh, the, the, the manager of the stores um, and now is known as Tula Lotte, um, oh, cool. a, a comic book artist of note who did uh, Supreme Blue Rose. Yeah. And now she does uh, movie posters for Mondo. And I think she did one for Formula One and covers for DC and IDW and so forth. Um, so... Um, I had been working on Lisa's Thought Bubble anthology, which is published by Image. I connected Lisa uh, before her, her art career took off. She was publishing um, a, an annual anthology to support the Thought Bubble uh, festival in my hometown of Leeds. Um, so she would um, get short stories from various creators, including myself. Uh, Tim Sale and I did a strip for the Thought Bubble yeah. anthology. Boo Cook and I did a Judge Dread Elephant Men crossover. Ha. And um, yeah, it's collected in Elephant Men shots, which you can find on Comixology. Um, so we were doing these monthly sort of newspaper anthologies and um, we were putting them together and I would see them. I would see all the artwork. I would check the proof. And on the back of one of them four years ago was a one-page strip uh, created by Abigail uh, from a script by uh, uh, another writer. 
And I looked at that and I was like, who the heck is this? And um, well, coincidentally, she came to a signing I was doing in New York and showed me the artwork. And I, I looked at it and said, I've already seen this. Is it your work? And she said, yes, she, she was 21, 22 at the time. And um, I said, you're ready to go. Bring me your portfolio this weekend at the Thought Bubble Festival, which she did. And I offered her a, a, a one issue of Elephant Man on the spot. Um, and I knew that she loved Doctor Strange. So I did a Doctor Strange pastiche mm. called Strange Medicine using one of the characters that is now a linchpin in Ask for Mercy, which is Alizarine. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it was a, it was one of, it was a sort of um, Ebony, who's one of the central characters of Elephant Man, drinks a cup of tea and then has this kind of fantasy, um, a healing experience, and and he sees lots of monsters and revisits his past. And it was it was a twenty eight page. Um, I would write splash page for Abigail, and she thought I meant double page. <laughs> so I got six extra pages because she didn't understand the page direction, poor thing. Um, but I knew when she had finished that um, that she should should be working professionally. And I shared her information with a lot of my contacts in the industry, and, and she didn't get a nibble in a whole Ooh. year. Ooh. So I called her up and said, are you free? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, do you want to work? We had actually gone to a – I think I went to visit. And she came to Leeds, and we went to uh, the, the Imperial – well, it's not the Imperial War Museum, but it's a, it's called the Royal Armouries in Leeds, and it's, 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 it's warfare through the ages. And we were walking around the museum uh, with, with my, two of my kids who were teenagers at the time, and she'd had this dream the night before about these monsters. And I said, you know, I always wanted to do a comic book that was the Ghostbusters fighting ghosts, but the Ghostbusters were ghosts. Yeah. And I said, why, why don't we do monster hunters that are monsters? So... The the villains in As for Mercy, the Croach, mm -hmm. are based on the nightmare she'd had the night before we were getting together to talk about doing something. And we were originally pitching that to Webtoons um, because my friend Carl Alstetter had been doing a series called, I think, Mirage uh, or Mirror at mm -hmm. Webtoons. And... Um, I was looking into that and I met with Tom Akel when he was at Webtoons. Um, but I also wanted to pitch Elephant Men and he didn't want to touch something that was on another streaming platform, another digital platform. Mm -hmm. So we we still were talking about doing As for Mercy over there. Um, and then Chip Mosier at Comixology called me and said, um, uh, we're looking for pitches. And I said, well, it just so happens uh, that um, this young artist, and I directed him to issue 72 of Elephant Men, which he checked out. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, we'd like to see more. So uh, before San Diego that year, Abigail did like five pieces on of, of character development, just sort of pinups and, and a, a basic atmosphere for the series. And Chip signed us up and, um, you know, we were, again, one of the first books out of the gate uh, two, two, two years ago now. Two years, June 2018, we launched both Ask for Mercy and Elephant Men. So, and, you know, she's been a dream to work with. Um, I, I don't, I work very differently on Elephant Men. I do, I do page breakdowns. I, I do thumbnails and send those to my artist and write the script from my thumbnails. With Abigail, I give her a much broader canvas because she's so imaginative. Right. Um, I, I throw a lot of splash pages, which come back as just one page now. Um, because, you know, she she's just a magnificent artist. She will sit there at a show and in half an hour, she, she does this beautiful illustrations based on somebody. Will you draw me, you know, a mole riding a dragon? And boom, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so the, the challenge really, I, I, I feel like I up my game 
because we are creating this together. We we've um, she lives in York, mm -hmm. in Yorkshire. My brother lives in Harrogate, 25 minutes away. So when I stay in England with my family, um, she comes over and we've we've had a lot of sort of, hey, where, where are we going this season? I, I'm thinking this direction. She's like, how about this? What about these characters? Um, and at the end of every issue, we talk about where the story is going. You know, we FaceTime just like we're doing now, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's been a really interesting creative relationship and um we both love our characters and i think that comes through especially with budgie and uh right. you know because they because some of these characters are dark right um, and they're very prickly with each other uh as families can be so um you know we i, th I think the, the biggest strength of the series is that sort of we are very caring about our characters and um we we care about where the story's going you know and, and my favorite sequence of all whatever it is 15 16 issues to date was president andrew jackson yeah who, who turns up in issue three of season two completely unexpected but um yeah. abigail just wanted so badly to draw him so uh he basically emerges from the grave and has a <laughs> and has a battle with Ratmere and Mercy and yeah. and is on the cover. And actually the CEO of Comixology uh sent me a, a fan letter. He loved that issue. So yeah. and of course, we're talking about Trump's favorite president. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely uh great stuff. It's one of those um I think the the team of you and abigail is something that um is, is something that really makes the book because it's it's what you, you know you y'all's team up is something that um if it wasn't this team it, it i think it would be vastly different you know like i said earlier it's yeah. um storytelling and her unique um just artisan that just really brings everything together yeah, and I like to work with artists who color their own work, and I can't imagine. In fact, I've seen four pages of Abigail's work in the Thought Bubble anthology colored by someone else, and it's just not the same. She, right. All her energy comes out at each level. Pencils, mm -hmm. a lot of energy in the pencils. Then she does uh, wash, you know, which is a sort of gray tone, mm -hmm. uh, much the same way that Tim Sale worked on, on the Marvel books. Yes. And, and then she adds color uh, in Photoshop. So th there's so much energy and understand. Nobody, no one understands how to color their own work like the artist because they know where things end and other things begin. So I, I like to work almost exclusively with artists mm -hmm. who uh, color their own work. I did a series two years ago with Shaky Kane, who had worked on a number of issues of Elephant Man at Image. Mm -hmm. And he and I and Taylor Shineline from Image um, did a book called The Beef, which is probably uh, my favorite of everything I've written. Um, I'm a vegetarian, and hopefully by the time you finish reading The Beef, you will be too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, you know, it's, a, it's a, only five issues. It was a done in one. Um, I just love, love, love working with Shaky. Hopefully he and I are going to work together again soon. Um, he's got a very quirky sort of David Lynch meets Jack Kirby sensibility. Um, so I'm very lucky to work with very different artists. And I do try, I think every writer knows this, that if you don't write what artists want to draw, you're going to get something that looks like they didn't want to draw it. Right. Uh, Abigail wants to draw monsters. So my challenge has been every five pages, I want a monster in the story. So if you, you can you can study the issues, especially the last see this last season, we've really um, you know, it's a, it's an invasion of Earth story. So there has to be lots of formidable monsters. You know, we've we've basically got the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Right. Um, and the way Abigail has drawn those, especially the cover of issue two, is frightening. It's so 
chilling to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, she is. She truly is great. Yeah. So with you're obviously a huge proponent of digital comics and the media moving forward the, in that direction. Uh, do you continuing to continuing move forward in the, the direction that most people are reading comics today? Yes. Do you feel that Ab Abigail's art benefits from being seen digitally? I mean, do you feel like in, in paper form, something might be lost in that regard? Well, you know, um, Asa Mercy was available as print on demand, mm. you know, so. So you've got it right there in your, do, do you yeah. think as the co-creator, do, do you feel like it translated okay? Well, you know, um, we go and see a movie, you know, in a theater or we used to before 2020. Um, and we don't take it away with us, do we? We don't hold it in our hands. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the best comics, a lot of the best comics I've read, um, I, I almost don't realize I'm reading a comic. I'm, I'm into the story. I remember when I read Daredevil 181, which was the first death of Elektra. Um, I read that so fast. I had to read it again. And then I had to read it again because I couldn't believe what I was reading because it was so kinetic it was so visceral. You know, you really felt you were in the story and inside Bullseye's head. Um, and a lot of the best comics um, are like that. You know, right. you, you almost don't need to own them, right? And I really like the swiping feature in Guided View on Comixology because you can control the pace of the story. So you'll see in As for Mercy, we have 12 panel pages, nine panel pages, where each image is the same size, and then we'll slow it down with a splash, or we'll slow it down with two half pages. So there's a lot you can do to control the reader's experience of reading. You can have a chase sequence that almost feels animated because you're swiping. Um, it's definitely taken me back to basics in terms of, you know, the frame of the um, the panel is all that matters. You don't need broken glass layouts. You don't need, uh, you know, the, uh, a pinup artist drawing your book. You need to have pace. You need to have page turning, you know, because especially in these days, when you stop watching a, a movie on on Netflix and don't go back to it, that they record that. And they, they probably, they, 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 they pass on a fraction of the income to the, the studio, right? Because, because it wasn't engaging enough. Same is true of ebooks. Same is true true of e-comics. So you really want that pace. You want people to get caught up in the story, which is basic storytelling 101, right? So you really need to approach digital comics as compelling stories, and that's the same way you want to approach regular comics, right? Yeah. So this, I don't really see a distinction. I just see that the the way we consume has changed. And, and part of that was the dying number of comic book stores all across the world, which means that Comixology takes cat whole catalogs of comics to corners of America, corners of the world, Australia, New Zealand, all these English speaking countries that didn't have the same access to comics that they do now. And I grew up in a town, you know, during a time when it was hard to get hold of American comics, unless you had some kind of specialty comic book store and there weren't many around in the seventies. So when you found like, you know, you'd probably find two issues of the same, you know, se sequential, you were lucky to find two issues that were sequential because people like you were hunting them down and then you would read them and then you'd have to wait. And then there were subscription services. So I subscribed to all my favorite Marvel titles um so it you know what mattered to me was reading comics it didn't matter to me how they got to me you know i wanted to read comics and i and i felt engaged and i've always been more engaged by artwork than than even by tv or movies i've always felt the combination of uh art and story or even just a piece of art all my favorite novels, I realized that all the science fiction novels I read in my teens had paintings on the covers, and they were beautiful paintings because I had good taste. It was Frazetta, <laughs> you know, it was Chris Foss, Frazetta, it was um, 
Jeffrey Jones, it was Bruce Pennington, all these great uh, artists of the 70s and 80s. And I, and I think we're all sort of attracted to that. That's why, you know, that's why a variant cover is appealing, right? Because it's just a trading card, really, but you can't resist that Art Adams cover or that Alex Ross variant or uh, Nick Bradshaw variant, you know. So, um, the, you know, the, the future's already here. I, I am a big believer in digital comics, partly because... There's no production cost. And I've been selling fonts for 25 years and there's no manufacturing cost. You know, when you sell it, you're selling binary code. It doesn't really exist. Right. Um, you know, and, and that only really hurts the collector's market. But collectors are fine. There's lots of things to collect. There's Mondo prints. I think this is a Mondo print. This is a Eric Powell. Planet That's pretty damn cool. You know. Um, which I had to have because I love Planet of the Apes. Um, yeah. there's, a lot of, there's so many things competing for uh, our our precious three ninety nine or three hundred and fifty dollars. What you know? There's so much out there. You, we don't need to get caught up in whether it's made of paper or digital. And the stores will be fine. All the stores will be fine because they they will. Maybe they need to get behind some Kickstarter projects. Yeah. You know, maybe that's the next thing that Kickstarter is heading towards where, where retailers get together and order 500 copies of the new Jeff Lemire Kickstarter project or the John McRae, Mighty World of McRae Kickstarter project. You know, there's so many uh, projects out there that we should be supporting rather than same old, same old, warmed up, variant cover, mischief that the mainstream companies are constantly involved with there's so much good project uh good good oh um, absolutely we are yeah. we are it, there's an embarrassment of riches when it comes to quality oh, yeah, this is a golden multitude all genres right mm -hmm. now I, yeah. I mean i was looking at my pull sheet the other day oh. and i've i've got more independent books right now than i've ever had Ever. And Comixology Unlimited is only five yeah. ninety nine a month. Yeah, and you can read all those books instead of you know True story. having True story. Board, twenty books. Wait, <laughs> don't tell my wife that. that. Wait, <laughs> <laughs> there's for for me. There's uh, you know I'm I'm an old school guy. I love the modern the mo modern stuff. Reading things digitally, but they're for me anyway. Uh, I'll always love holding a comic in my hand. And that's something that's dying out. I mean, I'll, I'll be fresh to... I'll be, no, I'll be it's not. That's a a dinosaur in that sense. That's a myth. It's not dying out. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Yeah. It, it is absolutely <laughs> boulder dash, as we'd say in England. Poppy pop. Poppy <laughs> well, I remember when digital comics, I don't know, 10, 12, 13 years ago, started really getting big, right? And everyone said, okay, you know, this is the death knell of the print book, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And here came Mark Wade, And Mark Wade's like, no, guys, this is a good thing. And not for the first time, Mark Wade saying something had a lot of angry reactions. And <laughs> and he was, he was right. right. From retailers. He he knew the, the avenues. You know, retailers will be fine. There's yes, so I agree with that. much product. And retailers all over America need to raise more trade paperback readers. Um, you know, if you go on um, Amazon Use Like New and 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 just look up uh, the Spider-Man Ben Riley Omnibus Volume 1, mm -hmm. people are trying to sell that for $350. It came, really? out, it came out a year ago, right? But it's a small print run. So... Hardcovers become <coughs> collectibles, right? Um, paperbacks become collectibles, and we, you know, we're sort of kidding ourselves that only single issues are collectible. You know, lots of things are collectible if you have two people on eBay bidding for them. You know, so you know, retailers, my local retailer, Infinity Flux here in Chattanooga, they um, survived the diamond fiasco by putting on Facebook live shows, selling fixed prices, not bidding. 
it wasn't sort of an eBay situation. They they bought a few collections and they uh, they sold to the first bidders on, you know, they basically fixed it. Hey, this is $40 for this set. Oh, you've, you've asked for it. You're getting it. Um, and they did really well, so well that they're continuing to do those Facebook Live events and they do great. It's uh, Jason and Megan at Infinity Flux. You can see them on their Facebook Live page. Um, and I, I highly recommend it. I, I sort of look in and I've bought all this stuff like 10 times and I find myself saying, oh, it's only 40 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> because because we do, it's okay to want things in your hand. Kindle has been around 15 years, longer probably. And, you know, I read some things on Kindle on my iPad and, and I read some things in, in book form because, because, you know, I'm used to getting up in the morning and picking up a book. Um, all those things will exist. It's just that <clears throat> sales won't be as high. So we'll be doing, you know, I just ordered... Uh, Elvis Costello's um, uh, Armed Forces album, my favorite Elvis Costello album, which I recently yeah. bought for $15 in, uh, in uh, used, you know, um, <clears throat> because I had to have it because my old one is is in England somewhere. Ah. And, and now there's a nine disc vinyl set that I, I'm like, I'll buy that. I have to buy that. I have to, yeah. you know, so there will always be, specialty markets my dad was a scale modeler you know he made aurora ravel fx kits all his life and he used to take me into town i wanted to go and buy comics right but he would take me to these scale model shops and they were hobbyist shops much like comic book shops are now mm -hmm. right hobbyist shops always exist by people who really care about our industry know that that they will always need their wits to survive. There were lots of stores in the 90s that popped up out of nowhere because of the crazy hologram covers and death of Superman. And <clears throat> they just saw, they, they saw an opportunity to make a lot of money fast. They did it, and then they went out of business. But the stores that stay around, Midtown, Forbidden Planet, you know, um, uh, Tate's in Florida is one of the best stores out there. <clears throat> the stores that stick around tend to be run by good businessmen who love comics. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. We, more, we need more capable, good businessmen. We need retailers to get actively involved in Kickstarters, support indie creators. This has been a drum that people have been banging for a long time. Supporting indie creators does not mean selling Walking Dead over again. You know, that's great for, for Robert Kirkman, <clears throat> but it's not supporting indie creators. You know, yes, I love Robert. And Robert's done a lot for me. Um, but he would rather you bought one of his other Skybound titles. I guarantee you, you know, support the new projects because it's, it's great to, you know, <clears throat> stroke that nostalgic part of you that just wants – spider-man to be good again or batman to be good again but there's so, so many great batman books out there sure you don't even need to buy new ones mm -hmm. you know we we need new ideas we need the next you know saga we need um new projects that that retailers choose to get behind and support <clears throat> and yeah. not expect it every month because indie creators cannot be Marvel and DC. I, I love that um, Brian and um, uh, not Jenny. What's her name uh, on Saga? Uh, Fiona Staples. Fiona. Mm -hmm. I love. I love that they've taken a break. Good for them. Mm -hmm. And then they'll come back and it'll be like a relaunch. Mm -hmm. You know. But we we def. You know. We need uh, stores to support indie creators in a real way, and and in a supportive way. Not in a how much money you're going to make for me way, right? Because the future of stores <clears throat> is well run, um, you know, businesses that that support the art and and the form and look into new ways of ordering comics. That whole fiasco with Diamond, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm not surprised DC said, "Wait, wait, you're not carrying books right now." Well, we'll find another way. Of, of selling books that wasn't a you know that wasn't to spite 
<clears throat> retailers. That was to help retailers. That's to get products into people's hands. For right. sure. You know? Yeah. I, I wish, you know, um, you know, I, I wish that indie creators got as much support as Comixology Originals creators get because we're in their newsletter. You know, a friend of mine who doesn't read comics, she, she reads on the Kindle and Ask for Mercy was suggested to her through a Kindle. Oh. You know, <clears throat> so th there's a massive readership out there that doesn't even know comics exist. And there's a lot of people who knew about comic book stores in the 90s who've never been back to one and they would go back in a shot uh -huh. if, they, if they knew about it. And Comixology is leading people back to comic book stores. It's It gets to know what your tastes are. You know, I've, I've bought way too many hardcovers because Amazon knows, it knows me now, right? <laughs> right. Damn and, their algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, a good comics book store owner, you know, Mike Wellman at the comic book bug in Manhattan Beach. <clears throat> he used to pull anything that was drawn by Alan Davis because he knew he could sell it to me. You know, so that's a, a retailer learning your algorithm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, um, both comic bug and the infinity flux here um, have community based, you know, activities because you have to know your, your community and you have to understand what they're interested in. Yeah, most definitely. Absolutely. I, I know establishing that rapport with uh, my local comic shop guys over the years has led me to all kinds of things that I still treasure today. Yeah. You know, I got, I, I had my, my guy sold me the entire Grant Morrison and Richard Case Doom Patrol run for, you know, a song. Then he came across the Alan Moore Swamp Thing run. Same thing here. Have all of it. It's missing. It's got everything except the annual, you know? And I treasure these comics so much, not just because they're wonderful comics, but because of the wonderful memories that mm. I associate with how I came to them. Sounds and to me like you need to read more indie comics, though. Well, for example. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I, I will always. Um, there we go. Oh, you got there. there. Go. Yeah. Oh, hey, comics. Hey. Yeah. You read well, Captain Ginger? Uh, it's on my to-do list. I brought That's Penultimate it. Man this week. I have not read it yet, but I'm making my way through everything gradually that I always put out because they're just such a wonderful publisher. Yeah. Well, Captain Ginger, um, you know, we work on that, and uh, Stuart Moore is the writer, yes. and Jean Brigman, who you know co-created Power Pack. Mm -hmm. uh, she's she's a close neighbor to me. She's in Atlanta, um, and her artwork is just such a joy. So beautiful i'm so in awe of people that can draw i i call it effortlessly you know obviously mm -hmm. there's a lot of effort involved but she has such a, a confident line um and there's some just great books out there you know al ewing who's been doing a great run on the hulk uh has a new book uh whose name i can't remember the title's but, like 15 words yeah uh, it's, we it's, only find them when they're dead yeah. 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 And uh, I'll tell you what, I will always sing the praises of the uh, late and highly lamented uh, Outer Darkness by John Lehman. Just John a great, brilliant great book. Great creator, too. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, Mike, what, what, what are you kicking on uh, indie comics right now? Um, well, you know, speaking of indie comics, I'd like to touch on Elephant Men and. Um, the longevity of, of the book and getting to work with some really great um, artists for the stretch. I mean, Moritat and I think Mendelin um, has been on the book for probably at least a decade. If, if he has, it, he's coming, this is his 10th year on elephant man. And, yeah. you know, we helped launch the careers of Marion Churchland. Yep. Uh, Chris Burnham. Yep. His first image book was issue 16 he did a backup in issue 9 and 16 and actually i offered elephant men to him when justin morita left mm -hmm. um and and that was when marion was drawing three issues but axel came up to me at san diego uh chris did turn me down mm -hmm. um as did sheldon vela who did kill audio um over at boom but axel has been a perfect fit 
Um, but we've, you know, there's been, you know, Shaky Kane's done some issues. Yeah. Yeah. Abigail did did an issue. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, you know, people are always surprised when I say, you know, hey, you know, there's there's two Camilla Derrico covers here. There's Brandon Graham cover here. You know, so um, I I I do like to work with new talent, um, but you get very comfortable with the people that really get elephant men. So Boo Cook has done nearly, I think he's done 60 covers now. Um, Axel's done, I think 60 issues over 2000 pages, something ridiculous, um, you know, and, and the legality is, you know, this is my Hellboy. This is my goon. You know, this is the book <clears throat> that represents me the most and that I have, so much fun with you know this current season of elephant men is based on uh there's a british documentarian called louis theroux who i love and he's you can check him out on netflix he has a a documentary called my scientology movie on netflix and he's also 10 of his american documentaries are on hbo max mm -hmm. but i just put him as theo larue into the elephant men universe and you, you have a completely dis different perspective on characters that I've known a long time, you know? So <clears throat> I, I feel like I've got a sound uh, foundation and it's, it's not easy to build on because I have caught myself saying, Oh, I've done that story before, you know, or, or I've, I've written that moment before. Sure. Um, but I really, you know, when, when I started with elephant and I was like, can I do this for 10 years? And effectively I've been doing this for 18 years now. So it's a long running concept and I'm very proud of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even when you read elephant men, even now, I mean, it's like that, it's like that, you know, worn spot on the couch that is just so comfortable <laughs> to kind of slide into. And I, and I attribute that it's because it's like, you've worked with the, a lot of the same artists for so many issues and, you know, the artists return for covers and stuff like that. So it's just, it, it, it's just comfortable. You know, it, it just, it adds that, that familiarity where you can, when you, when you swipe, you know, when you're swiping either on a, a tablet or something like that, you just, you're comfortable with it and you, you just become like, Oh yeah, I know what to expect. Yeah. This is elephant man. Yeah. Yeah. It's hip flask. It's going to be. You know, having said that, there's, there's always a lot of people who say I've heard of elephant men, but I've never actually read it. Where do I start? Well, try issue one. There you go. And, uh, yeah, and you, you, can, yeah. you can start with uh, the, the comicsology original series where, where I do a, the first story, which is called death of shorty mm -hmm. um, is a revisiting through the eyes of one character who's dead in the first issue, mm -hmm. uh, flashback through his life, through the eyes of his friends, and tell retell the story from a different perspective. Right. So, um, you know, and, and the, I've, I've sort of challenged myself. That was a whodunit. The second uh, arc at Comicsology Originals was a heist uh, story, and the, this latest one is a documentary and I'm already plotting season four, even though they haven't given me the, the go ahead yet. Um, but there's something Axel and I want to do that will be different yet again. So I like use playing with the format and, and challenging myself to do every different kind of story I can, because that's, that's what keeps me interested and keeps Axel interested mm -hmm. and hopefully keeps the readers interested. So I, I've done the work. I've gone to the shows. I've done the signings. I, I've met my deadlines. I've, I promised I would do 80 issues at Image. I did 80 issues at Image. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think if you haven't, if you're watching this and you haven't read Elephant Men yet, if you have Amazon Prime, you can read all three seasons of Elephant Men Comicsology Originals for free. Ooh, Ooh. Prime account. Same with Ask for Mercy. Yes. Heard from Ask, of Ask for Mercy, haven't read it, but you have Amazon Prime. You can read it for free. I don't know how I'm making any money. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're clearly and, doing something right. And don't forget that um, Dark Horse have signed a deal with Comixology Originals to put everything into print. So 
Uh, if not next year, the year after, Ask for Mercy will be in print. Yeah, yeah, I'll be the first in one. In your local comic book store, which you should always support. And I always try. I, I order some books from Amazon, but I make a point of ordering from my local comic book store because I want them to be there because I love the community there. Absolutely. The community is so, so important Yeah, in, in the shop. I mean, even if it's just, you know, that tangential seeing the same familiar couple three faces every week when you pick your, pick your books up yeah. or fall through those back issue bins or, you know, whatever. It, it's it's true. Know, you kids, you don't realize the time when there weren't any stores. You didn't think anybody else read them. <laughs> you know, eh? I used to go through the market stall looking for back issues mm -hmm. of Marvel Comics. Uh, you know, when I was 14 and just the idea of a store that was full of comics was just like, yeah, science fiction. Absolutely. But the, but just, yeah, brilliant. And I, I just want to, you know, we've come up on our hour here and I think, and unfortunately oh. we're going to have to, yeah, we're going to have to uh, wrap it up, but I think we left it on a really good, really positive note, Richard. Oh, and I just, I just thank you so much for taking time to hang no out. Worries. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. And, yeah. um, you know, the, the adventures of, uh, hip flask and, and, uh, the rest of the elephant men and ask for mercy available on comiXology. And like Richard said, you should definitely check them out because they're awesome. Uh, the, the, the man himself, Richard Starkings, thank you so, so much for popping in Very welcome. With us for an hour. It's been a pleasure and, uh, you're welcome back anytime. Just, uh, let me know. Yeah, you absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that, that's it for us this week. Thank you so much for listening. I do want to give a quick shout out to, uh, Jeremy Davis from uh, my local comic store. He was in a very terrible car crash earlier this week. Uh, he's banged up really bad, but uh, he's got a long bit of a long recovery ahead of him in the hospital. So Jeremy, uh, we're with you, man. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you in the funny pages soon enough. Is he a comic book reader? I'm sorry. Does he read comic books? Yes, yes, he works uh, at All Star Comics here in Oklahoma. Send me his address, and I'll send him some signed copies of Elephant Man and Ask for Mercy. Awesome. Sure. We'll get that to you. And they have to go to him. I mean, I, I know that you haven't read them, but he will read them. <laughs> I now, nah, oh, Richard, <sighs> the emperor has no clothes. <laughs> Quick, are we still live? Uh, we are. We are still alive. The whole world. Oh, just man, that was awesome. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for listening. This has been episode 101 of the Comic Watchers Show. Support your local comic store. Support digital comics. Read. Be kind to one another. And until next week, be good. There you go. Uh, thanks, guys. Have up.